It's self-evident, I think, that there are many digital tools and uh, techniques and platforms uh, that can support and aid collaboration. Um, and to tell us more about that, our next speaker is Ryan Shuttleworth from Amazon Web Services. His role there involves educating customers on the technical and business aspects of cloud computing, mentoring startups, and coaching developers and enterprises on their move to the cloud. He's a useful guy to know. I suggest you listen to him with great care. Ryan, the floor is yours. So, hello. Um, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you this morning. So as I said, my name's Ryan, and I've got this dubious job title in Amazon Web Services of an evangelist. So I'm here to convert you to the faith of cloud computing, is kind of my remit in life. Um, and I'm going to do that today by taking you through some examples of how cloud computing in general is affecting small businesses and enterprises alike, and how it's enabling digital collaboration. Some of the things that, that it's changing the world of ICT as we see it today. So um, first off, though, is that I'm the guy from the bookshop, right? So what's the guy from the bookshop here talking to you today about digital collaboration? I'm going to tell you the story behind how Amazon Web Services came to be, and how we moved from becoming a, a bookshop, in, uh, an e-commerce provider, and to deliver what we call utility computing. But I don't take returns, so if you've got any Amazon books you want to send back, or if you want some help with your Kindle, I'm not the guy to ask. But if you want to ask about IT, ask the questions later. So Amazon is a large organization. So hands up in the room who's got an Amazon.co.uk account. Pretty much everyone. Okay, so you bought books, you bought CDs, and you'll have bought things from Amazon through that infrastructure. You'll have also bought them through third parties. So like the original collaborative effort that we went through as an e-commerce provider was to open up what we did as a, as a, a business to third parties. So that's that middle line there, the seller business on Amazon.co.uk. If you're selling goods, you can publish them on the Amazon retail site. You can ask us to stock those in our distribution centers and ship them, collect the monies, and do all sorts of pieces of the puzzle for enabling an e-commerce uh, business. So we opened up what we did very early on to other people to help them gender their business. And that's good for our customers, good for you, good for me, because you get best price, you get best choice, and all those things that come with, uh, with that, that aspect of collaborating with a supply chain. But on the right, the IT infrastructure business piece, that's where I come from and that's what I do. So how do we get from distribution centers, some of the world's largest distribution centers where we're packing boxes, to unpacking boxes on the right where we're taking computers out of boxes and putting them on shelves and plugging them in and enabling that computing to be used by other people. So the journey started about 10 years ago and it started with that enablement of the sellers on our e-commerce platform. So when we opened it up to the outside world and allowed anyone to come up and say, I've got some products that I want to sell, from second-hand books to, to washing machines to shampoo, you can enable that through the, the, the Amazon infrastructure. And our IT had to get smart on how it did things to enable third parties to do that. And we started very early on with a little experiment where we published our catalog of books to the outside world via a little technical interface called a web service. So that people developing websites and other applications could embed a search of the book catalog on their own websites and do clever things with that and build that into their own marketing presence or their own blogs and so on on the internet. And that really took off. So we took a step back and we, we thought, well, what if we split up everything we do, not just the e-commerce side, not just our catalog of products and books, but everything from the bricks and mortar through the software and the services and the, the, the networks and the servers that we operate to run our global e-commerce infrastructure and enabled that to be consumed by the outside world? What if we did that? And that's where Amazon Web Services was born. And it was about six years ago now that it happened. But a common myth is that what we did is that we bought too much stuff to run our internet business, too many servers, and we sat back and we scratched our head and said, what are we going to do with that? Well, let's sell it to other people, let's rent it out. Well, it's a myth, because Amazon Web Services isn't excess capacity from the retail store, and come Christmas, when we take lots and lots of orders and have lots of demand for our computing, we don't take things back from our customers. 
So six years ago, we made the strategic decision to say, we're going to be an infrastructure provider. And my boss, Jeff Bezos, the CEO, he started Amazon retail store um, in his garage in the Seattle, and he's a self-professed geek. And he had a passion for books, and he had a passion for technology. And he put the two things together and started the store. Now, he's a geek, and he'll say in our shareholder briefings that we're a technology company first and foremost, and everything we do is to try and enable businesses, whether they be developers, whether they be managers of businesses, to leverage the benefits of technology in the simplest way possible. And some of the customers that are using it um, are extensive. So a lot of brands up there you may recognize. So hundreds of thousands of businesses, from one-man bands through to very large multinational brands are using Amazon Web Services to run their digital backends. Um, an interesting stand about the scale that we operate at, um, and the scale that we operate at is a, an important part of how we can then flow that down the supply chain, because we operate at an economy of scale that means we can pass on things at a very cheap price. But every day, we add the equivalent capacity to power Amazon retail store, the online e-commerce outfit, when it was a $2.7 billion turnover business. So that's how much stuff we're putting inside our data centers, how much computing, how much network, how much storage to run the ICT of other businesses every day. So it's a significant endeavor for us. And that cloud, as it's called, touches you every day. So some of the brands that are up there from Samsung, who has one of these new Samsung smart TVs? Lucky enough to have one of those. A few people? Well, on that TV, all the smart hub where you can get all your, your Netflix movies, you can download the little apps that work on your TV, is all delivered through the Amazon Web Services cloud. Um, your fuel supply chain, and where from Shell doing research on where they're going to drill next, through to the mechanics of, of um, delivering fuel to petrol stations, is all managed through the Amazon Web Services cloud. Of course, you can buy things through Amazon.com, they're also running on their own cloud, the Amazon Web Services cloud. Um, so everything from the bottle of that bacterial detergent that you use from Unilever, the science behind that has been done in cloud computing, uh, the films that you watch on Netflix, and anyone use Dropbox maybe to share data between things, a few hands up there, that's all backed on Amazon storage. Okay. So we're enabling an ecosystem of businesses by providing fundamental infrastructure at a highly reliable, highly scalable, and really cheap price point to enable these things to be built and revolutionizes really the, the IT landscape as we see it today. So what is cloud? Well, think of cloud like you think of electricity like an, or a utility like gas. Okay. You can use it when you want it on demand and you pay for what you use. You're metered. When you turn it off, you don't pay for it. Um, and you expect electricity to be uniform wherever you plug in to be the same, and it's always be there um, when you turn the switch on. So electricity as a utility is a great analogy for the infrastructure um, behind uh, computing. So the data center, if you like, where you run computers, where you have networking, you've got databases and storage, we make that available in everything that goes on inside there on the same basis. So when you want it, it's there. When you don't want it, you're not paying for it. And it's always the same, and it's always available when you turn it on. So utility computing is the backbone, really, of cloud computing. You shouldn't have to invest in servers, in equipment, and in software, and have to manage that to use cloud computing. You should be able to just tap into it and turn it off when you're finished. Um, and computers and infrastructure are the factories, if you like, the, of today's modern businesses. And in the times gone past, before the national grid, everyone generated their own electricity to power their own factories. And a grid of cloud computing is a similar thing to the move we made from stopping generating our own electricity to plugging into the national grid to generate the power, to take the power to run our factories. So the cloud is global. So we operate regions all around the world where when you choose to put something in a region, it stays in that region. And the one obviously relevant to us is the, uh, the region in the EU. So we operate in the EU and you've got nice data jurisdiction uh, around your data, which I'll touch a little bit later. So treat IT as a utility is the lesson, really, number one about cloud. To consume it as you need it and turn it off when you don't. And that's really important whether you're starting a business and you need a little website and you don't know whether it's going to be a successful business or not, 
or if you're running a larger enterprise where you're dealing with having to scale up and manage IT and the cost of IT and having things running 24 by 7 reliably. Okay, the same applies. So why does that matter? So first thing about cloud to take away today is that it allows you to do things quicker and cheaper. So the idea being is that you've got an idea and you want to get to profit. So the title of my presentation included the word profitability. So we'll talk about how you get from idea to profit. When we spoke to Amazon retail and we speak to other customers, when they're taking an idea and trying to deliver it as a reality, they spend 70% of their time on average doing what we would call heavy lifting. So that is installing servers, putting software on their servers, sorting out maintenance contracts around their servers, getting the support right, um, and it's general complexity that detracts from the actual task in hand, which is the remainder, 30% of doing your business. So if you want to put a business online, you're spending most of your time doing all the muck, if you like, related to IT. And AWS lets you get there quicker. The idea being is you can tap into that utility and take away the need to have to do all those things because Amazon's doing them for you. So it removes the muck involved in operating IT. So you can go from idea to profit quicker. And also, if something doesn't work, you haven't invested any capital expenditure in the IT to enable that to happen. So you can experiment. You can, you can, you can change what you're doing quicker to react to how the market's maybe moving for you or your business is evolving without having to worry about this asset that you've got living underneath the desk in your business. Now, an example of this is a, uh, a company called Animoto. Um, Animoto, they had a, an idea, and there was some guys at university that um, had an idea where you could upload an MP3 to the internet, and you could upload some photographs, and it would take that music track and mix the music and the beat from the music into a movie with the photos. So it created a little funky movie, and then it would allow you to download that movie back. Now, they had the bright idea of allowing somebody to sign in via their Facebook account and doing the same task, but looking at the Facebook albums that they had in their account. And after they generated this movie, all the people that were tagged, all their friends that were tagged in those photos, well, they will send a notification to say, hey, you're in a movie, come look at it, would you like to do one yourself? So they sat back, and they were running at these things called instances, we can see here. These are servers in AWS. They had 40 of them, so quite a significant operation. They were doing quite well. But when this thing hit um, and they, they launched their Facebook modification, it went viral. And you can see here that they had to scale up to 5,000 servers in three days okay, to handle the demand. Now, if they were having to go and order that equipment and ship it and install it in a facility to make that run, to run their website, it would have been game over. It wouldn't have happened. Their, their service would have been flat on the floor and they wouldn't have been able to recover from that. And given that they were two guys in a broom cupboard, that's pretty impressive because they tapped into the utility to enable them to take that resource and just pay for it as the curve went up. And when it went back down again, they stopped paying. And that's the sort of resources that you can, you can access as a business. But you don't have to be sort of these guys in funky clothes in New York to do that. Um, you can get started with business applications just as easily in Amazon Web Services. And there's a thing called Marketplace where you can go and choose. For example, if you're an e-commerce business and you want to install Magento, one click, you can have your e-commerce back-end platform running in AWS. Likewise, if you want a website, you can install WordPress and off you go, one click, and you're away, and you're paying for it on a metered basis. And you can see that it's actually two cents an hour there, so very cheap um, prices to get hold of this sort of stuff. A second influence of cloud computing is it transforms what's possible. And I'd like to give an example that really stretches the imagination and puts the hairs on the back of the neck. Um, and it's around science, okay? So it transforms the science as possible. And a real example here is some people that produce what they call a 50,000 core computer in the cloud. Now your average PC, the laptops that you probably got with you are two cores. So that's 25,000 laptops all strung together and to make a big supercomputer in the cloud. So why did that matter and you know, why would they ever need to do something that large? Well, they were looking at this problem. So cancer um, is obviously a, a major um, um, global problem that people are trying to address and trying to do the science behind looking for cures and drugs that can treat the problems. Um, and every day is crucial to these people. So every day lost is more people that suffer from the, the travesty of cancer. 
So they work with a company called Schrodinger, who does computational chemistry analysis, so designing drugs in a computational way to try and address the problem. And what they're trying to do is to identify these things, they're curly things, they're proteins, um, essentially the locks on cancer, and then to find the molecules that will fit, or the keys that will fit those locks, to try and unlock and solve uh, the problem. So their challenge was to run what they call a virtual screen. So a model in the virtual sort of computer land of running how to crack these locks with different molecule proteins of 21 million different compounds to a very high degree of accuracy. Now they sat there and they did this analysis and said, well, it's going to take about 12.5 years to run this model. Okay, so an every day is crucial. Well, that's quite a long time. And they did it in Amazon in three hours and it cost them $5,000 thereabouts per hour, $15,000. Instead of $20 million of infrastructure to build a data center and install those 25,000 computers. Okay. So I know it's an extreme example of what's transforming what's possible, but the differential in price there is dramatic. Okay. $15,000 versus $20 million. So even if you're doing something small scale in your businesses or middle scale, you can achieve the similar sorts of economies of scale by using cloud computing. And you can do things that might not have been possible before. You just simply couldn't afford to do them before because you had to invest capital expenditure. You can now do this on an operational expenditure basis. So every day was crucial to those, and they did that in three days. And if the experiment didn't work, they could stop it and they could start it again. Okay? They're not having to wait for a 12 and a half year computation to run. So you can do great things too. And one of those things is you can enable collaboration. So the whole purpose of today is the, the collaborative aspect of IT. Now, cloud is a great place for collaboration because all you need is an internet connection to get to it. And everything that's up there is accessible to everyone else if you choose it to be so. So some ways of um, AWS and the cloud in general enabling collaboration. The first thing is information. So it lets you create data, store it in the cloud, and to remove the boundaries for access for that information whatever that information be, whether that be things that you want your customers to get hold of, whether that be things in your supply chains that you want to share, um, or whether it be your own private data that you want up there and accessible to employees that may be distributed around the place. So a great example of something that's running on Amazon is Dropbox. So you all had some hands up there. So if you're using Dropbox today, you are using Amazon storage service, the same storage service that you're using if you've got a Kindle. Anyone here got a Kindle? Okay, and those books that you're downloading all backed off onto that same storage platform. Okay. Another thing that allows you to interact, so it enables global interaction on the data. Because everyone, all you need is an internet connection and the permission to go look at that data, you can get it from anywhere, from your phones, from your Kindles, your iPads, your computers. So um, another thing about interaction around information is that there can be times when that information is under huge demand. Okay. Things, unexpected things happen that mean that sometimes you just can't cope with the number of people that are coming to you for a piece of information. Whether that be the social effect, you may have had a successful time in your business and publicized that socially and everyone's at you. You might be into charities and the London Marathon happens once a year and you have unprecedented demand on your, your sites. Or Channel 4, talk about the Divina effect. So something crazy happened in Big Brother and their websites were put under such massive demand that they needed to scale these things out. And the cloud allows you to scale out and interact with all those people that are coming at you rather than pushing them away. Um, socially, um, cloud enables web scale social connections and understanding. So Amazon's the, like the, the past master of this, of understanding what people are doing inside the Amazon retail store and the reviews and comments that are going on. But other businesses take that further. So Etsy, for example, understand what you're doing socially in your social networks to drive the recommendations they make on what they're publishing to you as the products they think you should buy. So if, you, if you're an Etsy user and you've signed in via your Facebook account, you've given it permission to look at the things that you like, you don't like in those social networks that drives the gathering of that data to drive a better experience for you. Okay? And that's only possible because of the connection between these different cloud systems. And then crowd is an interesting one. So there are lots of things that computers are really great at, but there are things that they're just abysmal at. Um, and for that, you can enable a global workforce of real people doing real tasks for you. And we have something called the Mechanical Turk that lets you do that. Um, so an example of that, of a real example of a guy that wrote a book without having to write a book. Okay, so what he did is he went around and he spoke to lots of different people and recorded what they were saying, took little video clips, 
and then snipped them all up and put them into this thing called Mechanical Turk. And he distributed the work for how that got transcribed into a document by people, and he paid people a small amount for every little bit of transcribing they did through the Mechanical Turk. And out the back end popped a book that was published and was very successful. And it cost him $350 to do that, because he collaborated with a global workforce of people to do a task that would have taken him years to complete if he was doing it himself, so he could do it in a massively parallel way, interacting with real people to do small jobs. And interestingly, a lot of people in the US do this. You'd think that this might be somebody you know, in the third world sitting around doing these sort of tasks in India. The vast majority of our people doing these human intelligence tasks, as we call them, are actually in the US. Um, another um, example of collaboration, you may have uh, heard about this on Radio 4, which recently talked about, is the Thousand Genomes Project, where we host the genetic code of a thousand people that have agreed to publish this, and we host it for anyone that wishes to access it. So the ultimate in collaboration around data about people, and on top of that gets layered their medical histories, and as things change in their lives, it gets layered on top. People analyze that data and publish it back. So a deep catalog of understanding the cause and effect around genetics on the human being. Um, but you may be worried about <coughs> where your data or where your stuff is when you put it in the cloud. Um, but there's a, an interesting sort of point to make around the security and compliance of clouds. So for us, it's a number one priority. It is our business to make sure things are secure. And when we've got customers like Amazon working on it, when we've got people like banks running on this platform, you have to take it pretty seriously. But you should know that your data stays where you put it. So if you consume a cloud service, you should look at this as an angle of, of asking them where your data is going to be. Because some cloud providers will, won't tell you and it could be anywhere in the world. And that might have issues for you, particularly if your data can't leave the EU, for example. Whereas with Amazon Web Services, you choose to put it in the EU, it will stay in the EU, no questions. Um, so EU West Island is the one that's most interesting for us today. Um, and you control your data. So another thing to think about cloud computing is it's no different from really running something on a server in a co-location facility where you've rented some space or a server down the road in a little data center. Because in that environment, just like in Amazon, they take care of a bunch of stuff. So we take care of fundamental things and make sure they're operated to the highest standards. And everything on top of that is your responsibility. So what you install on these computers in the cloud, what software you run, you know, the passwords you set on your, your back-end e-commerce platforms are down to you. If you leave the door wide open, people can get in. Okay, so don't think that the cloud changes the dynamic of security in any way. It's very much similar to what you've been doing already, so don't be frightened of it in that regard. Um, and indeed, for, for Amazon, we're globally certified to the highest standards. So whether you want to take credit card transactions and run PCI-compliant things in the cloud, you can. We're ISO 27001. In the States, we can hold government data for around citizens. We're certified to that higher level. And we're working continuously with um, the UK around how we deal with this from a regulatory perspective as well. So always keep watching what Amazon's doing in this space. Uh, but don't ask me where this stuff is, because they won't tell me. Um, they won't tell me where it is. It's somewhere in Ireland. We have a number of facilities. Okay, and that's as far as I get on the information. So we operate to the highest um, international standards. And I was speaking to the chief information officer of a large American bank, and um, he laughed at this because he said, well, of course, you actually invest in security. It's your business. And we as a bank don't. We do it as a secondary thought. We secure our stuff once we've delivered our services. And that's true. So our prime investment goal is to make sure that everything we do is consistent and operated to the highest levels of security. Um, one breach of security for us, and it's game over. So it's good enough, security-wise, for all these people. Yeah, so um, again, uh, brands that you'll know and recognize and use every day. But it's also good enough for this. So I thought I'd give a, a more exciting sort of end to my presentation. So if you heard about Curiosity, the, the new Mars rover, uh, the size of a, a Mini Cooper, I'm told, and it careered through the atmosphere of Mars at 6,000 kilometers a second, slowed down to 1,000, deployed a parachute, slowed down to 200 meters a second, opened its eyes to see where the floor was. When it started to see the planet's surface, it launched some rockets, because it was easier to hover this thing than it was to actually land it, and then out dropped on a wire the Mars rover and trundled off. 
Now the imagery for the Mars rover was streamed real time from the satellites and the relay stations around Mars back to NASA and the JPL through Amazon Web Services infrastructure. And a bunch of the workflows around collating the images um, and using them for science is also managed through AWS. And I thought it's an interesting sort of out of this world example. So this is some of the early images, I know they're black and white, of Mars rover. Um, here more. So we're taking all the little snaps of images, printing back across, the, across space, back to Earth, knitting them together in Amazon Web Services and publishing them to the outside world as it happened. Now they had massive demand on that. Because I spoke to my son about this because I was trying to understand what was so exciting about the Mars rover landing to him. And his words was, it might crash that. Yeah? So everyone was tuning in to these live feeds to hear the biggest explosion that no one would ever hear if it ever happened. Um, but the images, it landed successfully, and NASA called this one, does my bum look big in this shot, because it's the rover looking back on itself. Um, some of the early images where it was checking out whether it had any damage or not. Um, and these are the guys, and you could tune in and you can watch this. And you can go back and watch the archives of this. And in the US, this was published on cable TV. It went to all regions of the world through the Amazon cloud. Now, they couldn't achieve that without leveraging that utility computing model. And it's a nice example of bringing many millions of people together globally into a single event. And then when that event subsided, they were able to scale back the resources they had. They didn't have to invest in all that hardware. They just started turning stuff off. So back to Earth. Um, cloud, for me, and the takeaways for you is it allows you to collaborate with ease. It's in the internet. It enables you to do that. It enables you to control who sees what. It allows you to create that sort of uh, policy over where data should be, who should have access to it, and who shouldn't. It transforms what's possible because you can, the cost of experimenting, the cost of failure goes down, so you can take more risks in what you're doing with your IT. You don't need to spend CapEx on servers, so you can release some capital and pay as you go. Um, so it yields large cost savings and allows you to focus on your core competencies. You shouldn't be having to worry about, you know, is this server running this website? Is it working or not? Is it plugged in? Is it patched to the right level? Is it secure? You can get that sort of taken care of by the cloud provider. Um, and you can get started for free as well. So for those of you that you've all got Amazon.co.uk accounts, you can actually sign up to Amazon Web Services with that account. And for a year, the whole bunch of stuff for free. So you could run your website. You could, if you run a small business, you can put a website up there. You could move your existing one and host it in Amazon free for a year. Um, so you can share information without boundaries as a summary. You can become a social business. You can start interacting with customers and supply chains in a much easier way without having to worry about the IT constraints around that. And thanks for listening, and enjoy the rest of the event. Uh, I'm sure that you will be inspired by that. There are people leaving. I don't think they're going to the loo. I think they're rushing off to get their Amazon account open to start a business <laughs> after that inspiring uh, presentation. We've got some roving mics, so if you have a question, can you put your hand up and somebody, Anne or somebody, will uh, bring you a mic? Uh, I can't see very well, but uh, any, any questions? There's one down there. Yes? Okay. Um, I'm starting a social network and uh, it's launching next year. So at the stage, at this stage, I don't know how much the service is going to cost me. So would I be able to run for a year to get an idea with the social network, even if it expands quite big? Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the free tier in Amazon gives you a certain amount of usage. So I think it gives you a couple of servers. It gives you so much storage and so on. And as soon as you start breaking out of that, you start to pay. But what you can do is you can put this little alert on to say, I, you know, tell me as soon as I spend more than $50 a month or something like that. And then you'll start getting emailed and you can decide whether you want to use more or not. So it's in your control. Oh, great, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, one down here. I noticed uh, plenty of commercial ventures on there. Uh, do you do anything for the public sector? Um, we, we do, and um, particularly in the US, we're sort of collecting badges of US entities, so um, a lot of US government agencies, they have a cloud-first strategy in the US. In the UK, we're working very hard in that, that sense, and we have a sort of pan-European public sector team that's developing the understanding, because some of the things in Europe it's fragmented in terms of data privacy and protection, slightly more complicated. So um, we are working hard, particularly academia is moving quite hard in this space. Um, 
and uh, some of the government agencies are speaking to us about tapping into this resource. Um, and, but it's early stages because of those data privacy and legislation problems in, in the UK particularly. But if you want to speak to someone to get more insight into how far that conversation is going, then let me know afterwards and I can put you in touch. Yes, one at the back. Hi there. Um, just with regards to private sector um, organisations, are you finding a, a greater trend towards people uh, migrating their in-house IT infrastructure to cloud-based services? Um, we are, and it's in, an increasing trend. So th there's obviously things in, in businesses that don't move very well to cloud. So very large enterprises that might have uh, mainframes or complex IT systems on very old different types of hardware type, they don't migrate. And I'm not going to stand here and say they ever will. So they'll, they'll sweat over time. So what we see is, is businesses moving things maybe that are greenfield projects, new projects into the cloud to explore it. They'll look at getting cost advantages around their disaster recovery. So if they're worried about the risk of something going wrong inside their IT and to have a backup of their data or a backup of their systems, they install those in the cloud and then have them turned off until they need them and then they spring into life. So a really cost effective way of doing that. So there are different types of use cases that people are, are using. But we have businesses like Shell, for example, where it's cloud first. So any project they do will be considered in the cloud first before they'll roll back to using internal IT. But it's a long journey. I and mean, bear in mind that Amazon Cloud has been around for six years. That's not a long time at all. So the way this is going to evolve, it's evolving fast. And um, it's something that you should, should keep an eye on in terms of running your IT for your business. Yeah, another one, uh, two at the back. Sorry, uh, in terms of uh, web hosting, uh, how, how can you distinguish uh, between the cloud hosting a website and the cloud and normal web hosting? Is there any difference between the two services? At, at a fundamental level, if you want to run a website, there's not a lot of difference. You're running a website. But when it comes to cost and flexibility, there's a huge difference. So for example, if your website grows, and you get demand on it, how do you deal with that in a normal hosting environment? You have to change your fixed term contract, you maybe have to pay a fee to move on to a different size of hosting package. With an Amazon Web Services, you can just simply tick it up and just ask for something bigger or add more, and you pay for what you use. If it doesn't work, you can turn it off. So a classic would be that your website maybe is under huge demand on a Friday night. Whatever you're doing as a business, it gets hit on a Friday night. Um, so a classic one for e-commerce is a Monday night. So I was speaking to people that run uh, people, things behind like very.co.uk, for example. Their spike is on a Monday night. On a Monday night, they scale their website up. And on a Tuesday, they scale it down. And they're paying only for what they use. So it's very different at that level from traditional hosting. But ultimately, you're, you're running a website. So that bit's the same. It's the cost, the dynamic that sits around it that's very different. OK, there's more control. More control. The cloud and Absolutely. And, and if you don't need the resources, you shouldn't have them. Just turn them off. They're disposed. It's like a utility. Why would you have every light on inside your house when the rooms aren't being occupied? It's the same concept. Traditional IT, you'd have to provision all the servers and run them all the time. Or a hosting package, you'd have to pay for that size of hosting package for a 12-month term. And there's no contract with AWS. You turn it off, you stop paying. Thank you. OK. Uh, another question just there, I think. Is um, increasing bandwidth becoming, as increased bandwidth becomes available to businesses, is that starting to drive more businesses towards using cloud computing? A absolutely, absolutely. And I, you know, I live in a, a bandwidth starved part of the UK. I live in North Norfolk near the Broads, so it's not a great area. But as, as the investment into infrastructure at that level increases, more people can run businesses from their, their bedrooms, right? More people can start up. All you need is a connection to the cloud to run infrastructure. It's like this virtual data center that can start from one machine to many thousands if you really get that successful. And as I said, all you need is a connection. You can do it over a 3G dongle as well. So um, internet connectivity is the key fundamental driver to a digital economy and to the adoption of these very large scale cloud services. Hi, um, not so much a question, but um, a comment really. Um, so I know that Amazon's been in this space for a while, and the cycle server example is brilliant. It's a use of science to support research and development. 
um, as a platform that you guys are providing. Um, I don't know if you know about the High Performance Computing Wales project. Um, we are a similar um, cloud initiative. If you're a company here based in Wales and you would like to make use of our services, we also have a free element of access that you can use. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, like Amazon, nowhere near as big, but um, we're doing some key interesting things. So for example, we're helping guys develop heart pumps. We're helping the National Botanical Garden of Wales with their um, Barcode Wales project that's looking at the flora and fauna around the country. And um, we're also hoping to work with um, other companies out there that are doing things in the sciences. So if you want free access to our systems. If you, uh, if you qualify for it, come and talk to me and hopefully we can do business. Awesome. Wish you every success. Great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question because I know Ryan has to rush to catch a train. One more question, if there is one. Lady at the front. Yes. yes, lady in the front. <laughs> Waving. Thank you. I just wondered if you'd like to comment on your customer service provision and how you incorporate social media into that. For our retail organisation, um, so I mean, I, I don't work for the retail organisation, so I um, can't really comment about some of the techniques they use. But what you know, they're certainly using techniques on your journey through the website. So as you um, do things on that internet um, site. Um, they'll look at what's going on. One of the examples I use for that actually is um, I was at a presentation around this concept of big data. So there's a, a term out there in the market called big data and it's how you consume vast amounts of data and use it to some value inside your business. And Amazon's been doing that sort of analysis for quite some time. Um, and I logged into my Amazon.co.uk site yesterday for a presentation I was doing in London um, and took a screenshot of the recommendations they'd made for me. And there was um, Indian oil treatment hair shampoo or something like this. And I was just, I looked at myself, oh, I don't use these sorts of exotic treatments for my hair. So I looked in my inbox and looked at some emails that had come through from Amazon. And one of the last ones was that there'd been some other types of shampoo left in a basket and not, not purchased. So I asked my, my um, girlfriend, I said, have you been using my Amazon.co.uk? Oh, yes, yes, that was me. I forgot to buy that. And she clicked buy on the, on the basket. Um, and that's a sort of couple of lessons. One, don't leave your Amazon.co.uk account logged in at home unless you want to abuse. <laughs> but the second is that they're using data that they've collected under the privacy policies that they've defined. So when you use Amazon, they're clear about what they're keeping. It's essentially what you're clicking on and what you're um, putting into baskets and how far you get down a journey. But they're doing it on such a scale that they've got so many millions of customers doing this all the time that they have to use techniques to analyze that data in a special way to drive some proactive marketing. So in that case, sending an email saying, hey, you sure you didn't want to complete this purchase? And it resulted in a purchase, and it resulted in, in value and revenue. Um, my girlfriend found it valuable. My, my credit card didn't. So, um, but that's an example of that's how it's used. How that breaches outside, um, I think it's quite limited to the sphere within Amazon. So, and uh, you know, as I said, I don't work for the e-commerce infrastructure, so I don't know it in any detail. And how would that translate across to the web services when small businesses are seeking customer support for the provision? Oh, for customer support. So, well, we have a customer support dedicated to web services. So if you've got a problem with it, you can send an email in. You can pay a very small fee. So you know when you buy support for IT, normally you've got to pay this big premium and give this sort of contract that goes forever. With Amazon Web Services, the support is pay as you go as well. You pay for a month. If you don't want it, at the end of the month, you stop paying for it. And they're great guys, they, you can phone them up, you can get help, you can pay for tiers, and you can help you understand the software you're running and what's gone wrong. So just as you can phone Amazon retail and get something resolved, very high levels of customer service, same with web services as well. But pay as you go support, it's just on the same basis. Okay. okay. Right, okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Ryan. <laughs>